we found that after you take off the bands, there's this magic window of about 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, where this metabolic response takes some time to actually be optimized. So in other words, at about the 12 minute mark, your human growth hormone, your adrenaline starts to kick in at a maximal level. So now you started that, you've taken off the bands, vascularly, you're prepared. And about 12 minutes later, hormonally, you are maximized. And that part of that is beta endorphin, the runner's high. And now you're feeling really good. So our professional athletes and our Olympians, our soldiers, special forces, army rangers, uh, uh, green berets, uh, Navy SEALs, they're using this before they have to do something because they know vascularly and metabolically they will be optimized. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and today we're talking about a new topic on the podcast. Um, I've heard about it through geriatric physical therapy in general, we're talking about blood flow restriction. I also heard about it recently in Dr. Peter Atia's book, Owl Live, which if you follow me on social, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of his work. So today I'm talking with Steven Munitonis, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Katsu Global. He's an inductee in the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame and the International Ice Swimming Hall of Fame. A Harvard graduate, he lived in Japan where he met Dr. Sato, the inventor of Katsu, and was trained under him and a team of cardiologists for 13 years before introducing Katsu outside of Japan. And this conversation is going to give you a really good understanding of blood flow restrictive exercise, what it is, what are the benefits, how is it different than normal exercise, how do you use it as an everyday person? What are some of the therapeutic uses for it? We're going to get all into that. So, um, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I love just to start with people's story. I think that's one of the most interesting things. Tell us how you got so into swimming and athletic swimming and how you had such an accomplished career as a, as a swimmer. Well, I grew up in Southern California. And my parents took me to the beach in Santa Monica when I was uh, six years, six days old, so they wow. say. And I've been swimming uh, since I was four. I joined the swim team. Um, I just happened to be in um, growing up here, training as a, a you know young person, teenager. Um, at the time where the U.S., in particular Southern California, was really the hotbed um, of uh, world record holders, Olympic medalists, et cetera. So I was constantly in the pool training with Olympic gold medalists, uh, world record holders, NCAA champions. So in my mind, um, the person that's swimming next to me my, was, was just the person I trained next to. I didn't view them as an Olympic gold medalist, a world record holder. So I had a very, a lot of uh, the world's best coaches when I was young and, and uh, that's just what I did. So um, I've been doing swimming now for 57 of my 61 years. That's amazing. So how, what did, first of all, what did you go to Harvard for? I think I'm also interested in that story. And did you swim at Harvard? Yes, I, um, I was again, um, uh, grew up in Southern California in, um, near downtown uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I just heard of this college called Harvard. I I didn't know it from, you know, uh, UC, I mean, I knew UCLA, I knew USC, the, the biggest colleges in, in Los Angeles, but I just had this, this fantasy that I should study hard and go to this faraway college called Harvard, which was an unbelievable experience. Um, I did play water polo. I did swim. Uh, so I was on two sports teams. Um, the people that I met there were incredible. One of my um, water polo teammates was Dr. Oz, um, the really? famous TV. Yes. Um, huh. he, he and I 
gone along famously. He was a hard worker. He was very intelligent. He knew what he wanted to do. And, and I was just there to absorb all of these opportunities and people that I had seen. I had, you know, I grew up in an area where um, it was Los Angeles, but, you know, uh, I had never seen snow. Uh, I, you know, to be honest, I never really um, understood um, how deeply people could study um, very selective topics. So I took a variety of, of courses. I, uh, it was my obligation to myself to meet as many people as possible and take a wide uh, range of courses that I did. I took physics, chemistry, but I also took, you know, art appreciation and, and I studied Greek coins, what have you. So it was a great experience, um, but I always knew I would return back to Southern California. I It was a great four-year experience, but I wanted to return back home where I grew up and I'm most comfortable. Okay. So you went to Harvard for four years. What did you get your degree in at Harvard? Economics. 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 Okay. Yes. So then back to Southern California, and then did you work in that field or did you go straight into kind of this sports realm? What's kind of your story after college? Uh, so when I was there, um, one thing that impressed me and that I did realize that there were a lot of kids who were there who simply wanted to build, they didn't want to work for anybody. They wanted to go off on their own, whatever it was, write a book, uh, 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 produce a film, create a company, create an industry, create a pro create products. And so that really struck me as you can set off on a path where you can create your future. Uh, a lot of risk there, a lot of responsibility, but but that appealed to me. And so that began my journey. And part of my journey was going to Japan as I was growing up uh, or as a after I graduated, the Japanese had started to purchase a lot of product, a lot of places in the United States, uh, uh, Pebble Beach, Rockefeller Center, all the hotels in or many of the hotels and properties in Hawaii. And so I decided to move to Japan. Uh, I didn't know a word of Japanese and I, I found myself eventually in the R&D labs of Hitachi. Uh, there were 6,500 Japanese and me, the lone non-Japanese. Um, and I truly don't, I, everything we did was in Japanese, Japanese writing, uh, Japanese speaking, everything we did was in Japanese. And, and part of my job was to take the Japanese uh, technologies and products and explain them to the rest of the world. Our, the rest of the world, in Tachi's case, was companies like Siemens in Germany, IBM in the United States, Apple, Xerox, et cetera. And part of that journey morphed into my uh, uh, selection to be part of the 22nd century project of Japan. It was a fascinating project. It was a it was a collective of private companies and um, Japanese uh, uh, creative people, inventors, uh, patent holders, and the Japanese government. And our goal was to look forward 100 years and figure out ways, technologies, processes, et cetera, that the Japanese population could, re could um, continue to be as strong, resilient, helpful, a hundred years in the future as they are now, or even better. So part of that process was being introduced to a Dr. Sato who invented Katsu. And so there begins my process with the Katsu group. Okay. And then when you met Dr. Sato, were you like, what is this? I mean, what was your initial reaction to this whole idea of a blood flow restrictive exercise? It was shocking. Um, yeah. I, I was told uh, I was introduced to Dr. Sato, and then he said, he kindly said, come to my laboratory uh, at such and such a day. Was, I remember that day. It was July. It was very warm, hot and humid. I went to his office and in a long line of older people um, standing outside his office. And one by one, they'd go in and they, they do katsu with him. And finally, it was my turn. And I walked in and he said to me in Japanese, he doesn't speak English, but he, 
said to me in Japanese, he said, where have you been? I've been expecting you. I, I just showed up to the office and I saw a long line. So I got in line oh. and then he did cuts on me. And I said, oh my God, Dr. Sato, this is great. It's wonderful. He started to explain it to me. And I said, Dr. Sato. And at the time I was not thinking of business. At the time I was actually thinking of my parents. And I was saying, this would be really great for my parents uh, who still to this day do katsu twice a day. They're 88 and 86. But at the time I was saying, Dr. Sato, I, I, I need to know this. This is so cool. What I felt in my own body was, was very profound. And he said, great. He said, I've been waiting to meet somebody who travels the world and knows English. And I said, well, that's me, Dr. Sato. And he says, okay, um, I, I'd like to teach you. And I said, I'd like to learn. And from that day until the time he said, you're ready to go and teach Cuts of the World was 13 years. Wow. Oh my goodness. Okay. There's so much to unpack there. So let's start with the basics. First off, what does Katsu mean? Is it an acronym? Does it mean it, something in Japan? Yes, it's it's actually a Japanese word. Okay. And many, you probably, and many people have probably heard of the word Shiatsu. Shiatsu is a, is a type of massage. She means hand and Atsu means pressure. Katsu means, K-A means additional. Atsu means pressure. So the word itself simply means additional pressure, which is precisely what the equipment does. Yeah. So let's talk about the katsu equipment. And um, I know that there's different uses for it. There's different sizes. And I, I just, there's a lot to unpack here, but let's start with the basics on what is blood flow restrictive exercise. Yes. So actually the, the acronym, it's uh, that blood flow, or we sometimes refer to as BFR, blood flow restriction. R restriction, unfortunately, is a misnomer. Um, and it, it actually dates back to Dr. Sato's first published scientific paper on this, where he actually used the word katsu in the, the publication, in the science, but the editors of the Journal of Applied Physiology said that's a Japanese word. It doesn't mean anything to uh, for our English um, publication. So we are going to change it to blood flow restriction and uh, or uh, blood occlusion. And Dr. Sato and the cardiologist say, no, 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 no. We're not occluding anything. And and I, I have the band on one arm, the mm -hmm. band, I, and I don't have it on the other arm, the band, here's the band itself. Now you can see the difference between this band and your standard blood pressure cuff. Mm -hmm. So the blood pressure cuff actually goes, as everybody knows, it goes around the upper arm and it squeezes very tightly. And then the healthcare professional checks your blood pressure. Katsu, and, and when it squeezes very tightly, it momentarily keeps the blood out of your limb. So the, the artery is squeezed very tightly and then they check the blood pressure. Katsu and these bands, the equipment does the exact opposite. So what the, the bands do it. So I have the band on one arm and I don't know if you can see with the lighting, but this is my normal color of skin. Yeah. And this is my Katsu color. What's happening is blood is going into my arm normally. And we call that our arterial flow. So every heartbeat blood is going into my arm as it normally does. But what the band does is it inflates and deflates, inflates and deflates based on certain algorithms, based on whatever goals you have. And then when it inflates and deflates, what happens is the arterial flow, blood goes into the arm normally, but coming back, it is slowed down every 30 seconds. Hmm. And when it's slowed down coming every 30 seconds, then you get an engorgement of blood in the limb. And you could sort of see. I can. This is the arm with Kakatsuan and this is the arm. So there's much more blood in my arm with the bands on versus not on the band. And so that's why Dr. Sato said it's not restriction. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. modification. It's a slowing of the venous return or the, the blood coming back to the arm. And it's not a permanent um, 
uh, 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 slowing down. It's just for 30 seconds. And that's why when we first showed Katsu to the military or professional sports teams or older people, we show them this equipment. But in their mind, they imagine this is the equipment. So in reality, this keeps blood in the limb. This keeps blood out of the limb. Therefore, uh, companies and people who do BFR use something similar to this. And people who do katsu use something similar to this. And we spent many, many years developing uh, this product. And this, this band is, it's now inflated. And, and the band is actually oval shaped in one direction. What that means is there's only pressure along the ridge of the band, which means that the artery, the blood through your artery, continues into the limb unimpeded, but then the vein coming out gets compressed eh, somewhere between five and 10%, just very, very minimally. Uh, so what that the effect of that is that all the capillaries in your hand, your forearm, your elbow, et cetera, and if you use it on your legs, your lower extremities, then all of the capillaries get engorged in blood. And simple movement, like I am doing right now, uh, talking with my hands, then simple movement is enough to stimulate our hormonal response. And so Dr. Sato created a band that actually allows arterial flow to continue unimpeded, venous flow to be modified every 30 seconds gently. So you can do, you can do push-ups, you can type on your computer, you can knit, you can read a book, you can watch TV, you can walk your dog, you can do all these things and get the benefits of exercise and rehabilitation. Well, let's dig into that just a little bit more from an anatomical standpoint. Um, I love anatomy. So the arteries are deeper in yeah. your muscle. Yes. And the veins are more superficial or towards the surface. Correct. So that's why that, that cuff just selectively places enough pressure to slightly restrict blood flow back superficially, but it doesn't provide enough pressure to close off the artery. Like if someone was applying a tourniquet, for example, to prevent severe bleeding on the leg, they want to shut off that artery with a lot of pressure. So just to kind of give another visual there, yes, right? Yes. You're absolutely correct. Okay, great. Yes. So I would like to dig into a little bit more of the physiology behind the benefits of that slight engorgement of the arm. So what happens from a physiological standpoint when there is reduced venous return and more blood, we're just going to like, let's use the arm as an example. Yeah. Let's say I'm doing bicep curls and I have the blood, the katsu device on what, what benefits am I getting that I wouldn't be getting or, or maybe the benefits that are augmented if I didn't have it on. Okay. So the first one, whether you're a professional athlete or someone who's 85, whatever, whatever range you're talking about, when you have the bands on and you have this engorgement of blood what Dr. Sato found and what the cardiologist told me, uh, taught me, and as we demonstrated scientifically, you can do very simple movement or movement with two pound weights that produces the same effect as lifting very, very heavy weights. And therefore, let's say that you uh, broke a bone. Let's say you have tendonitis. Let's say you are simply sore from uh, doing a, some kind of exercise the day before. With katsu, you can, in the extreme case, which we teach, you can put the bands on and simply move your limbs. This is the metabolic equivalent of lifting much heavier resistance. So as we age, or especially if we put a barbell on our neck, or on our spine, and we're doing some kind of leg exercise or, or any kind of exercise. And we know, especially let's say for high school boys, for college men, when they are in a weight room, the, the freshmen walk in and they got these big, huge seniors and, and the seniors are looking down at the freshmen and they're saying, come on, lift heavy, lift heavy. That is often when these younger boys get injured. 
It's because they've mm-hmm. got this peer pressure on them that's lifting heavy. Or we are a um, a working mother, and you want to get in shape. Let's say after uh, you know your first or second child, you go to the gymnasium, you look around, and you see all these really fit young people working out hard. You attempt to do the same, and you just lift or or you exercise too much for your body weight or body strength. So these are the practical examples. Or you are an 85-year-old person with arthritic pain and lifting anything, a a, a gallon of milk, it it creates a problem. So in all of these cases, they can very much benefit by putting the bands on and simply going through the motion that they would normally do either in exercise or in rehabilitation. And it, it is a way to augment movement. Uh, and that triggers the engorgement of blood in the limb. And this was the beauty of his uh, invention that triggers a metabolic response, which then depending on how long, what you do, et cetera, et cetera, that we, we apply uh, hundreds of different applications to that. Well, what is that metabolic response in the arm? So, so the, the first response is with the engorgement of blood in the limbs, and so you let's say this is a this is the vein or this is an artery. Now you have more blood in that blood vessel. Mm-hmm. So with every heartbeat, dun 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 dun, that actual vein or or capillary is expanded. So it's got more blood volume in there. So it actually expands even more. Okay. You have nitric oxide. Uh, release, you have a uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, you have a variety of, 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 uh, me- uh, of, of, of uh, responses, simply because the uh, blood vessel itself has more blood in it. That's the first um, response. And that that leads to an elastic, an increased elasticity of mm-hmm. your vascular tissue. Again, uh, physical therapists, uh, uh, trainers, uh, coaches understand that if I can get more blood volume in and out of a working muscle, you're going to improve the functionality of that working muscle. That's the first response. The second response is if you do some sort of limb movement, or if you do isometric pushes or isometric pulls, And these are for people, let's say, who have um, a cast on, use a walker, are bedridden, um, uh, have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, brace on their body, and they can't actually use their limbs normally. Then we ask them to, you know, push their feet against the bed. We ask them to push their hands together. When this happens, then you start to build up lactate in in the working muscle. With that lactate, sends a signal through the central nervous system up to your brain, and then your brain starts to release a variety of hormone that can include uh, growth hormone. And with the growth hormone, then there's everything from uh, beta endorphins to adrenaline to testosterone. And that's why soldiers or people who have lost a spouse, lost a child, et cetera, and experience PTSD, especially if they're male, and you have an increased uh, level of testosterone, that can be very helpful. And then thirdly, and, and this, I think you can appreciate this, is along the way, and again, if you do stuff like walking, it doesn't have to be a power walk, it doesn't have to be a run, it could be simple walking a dog or walking on a treadmill, or even walking back and forth in your living room, the, another um, element that is produced is in, uh, uh, IGF-1 or insulin growth factor. And that is why when physicians, especially at the VA or, or other places, they, they see a patient and uh, the patient may be overweight, may be under-exercised, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but they go in for a broken bone or a broken rib, whatever they have, then the patient comes back and the doctors call us and say, Hey, you know, we use katsu for rehabilitation, but we see these other effects. Like you didn't tell us about these other effects. And we say, well, you know, if you use katsu, there's a multitude of biochemical reactions that happen in the body 
that are were well documented and and um, uh, that were uh, demonstrated by Dr. Sato and this and his team of cardiologists internists in Japan. And we just attack one problem at a time, but there's many, many ultra downstream effects to this. Yeah, well, I, st- I have so many more questions, but I think for people who are skeptical, I, I would love if you shared how many Olympians were using Katsu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think well, it's, it's a really powerful technology that I think we're going to hear more and more about. Yes. So in the 20... 20- uh, people have been using katsu, or I should say more specifically, Japanese athletes have been using katsu at the Olympics since 1988. So the Seoul Summer Olympics, they started uh, using katsu, and they've been using katsu every summer winter Olympics since then. In 2020, we actually had 110 Olympic medalists use katsu. And again, most of those uh, uh, athletes were using katsu for recovery. So an Olympic athlete, although we watch them on TV and we see them, you know, run the 200 meter dash or swim the 200 meter freestyle or, you know, uh, uh, do some kind of uh, incredible acrobatic move on the uh, on a gymnastics floor. The real key to the Olympics is recovery. If you're already at an Olympic level, but you have to go through the preliminaries, the semifinals and the finals in a very short period of time, what our users of Katsu found that was the most benefit was the recovery aspect. So they would compete in their, whatever the event was, immediately they would either throw on their armbands or the leg bands. And their recovery process was enhanced significantly. So they were prepared to do another intense effort very shortly after. And if they made the finals, they were able to uh, repeat that process. And so why, how, why are people recovering so quickly with katsu? Very simple, you know, with your running or swimming or rowing, whatever you're doing, you're building up a lot of lactate. That's when your muscles start to feel pain. It, it's very discomforting. That's why the many coaches say, you know, um, uh, uh, no pain, no gain. That is this lactate, or some people call it, refer to it as lactic acid. It's building up in your muscles. In order to, re- to uh, recover as quickly and efficiently as possible, you throw on the cut spans. Again, for 30 seconds, there's a blood engorgement. And then for five seconds, the band deflates. When they deflate, that blood whooshes out very effectively. So as it whooshing is... is um, uh, clearing for the muscles, it's all also clearing out all kinds of metabolic waste. And so you repeat that for anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the athlete. Thereafter, it is like a super enhanced warm down and very effective because it's eliminating the waste products that, are, that have built up in the muscles during hard exercise. We do the same process If you're an older person and you're going through rehab, we use the same process. If you're a business person and you're traveling from the West Coast of the United States to Eastern Europe. So all our principles are the same. It's just the applications are different depending on the demographic, the age and the ability. One thing that I was thinking of from a recovery standpoint is when you get really sore muscles, One of the pieces of advice you might hear a lot is to go for a gentle walk to increase blood flow. So is that kind of a secondary means of um, reducing recovery time? Is it actually increases blood flow, but then it at the same time kind of shunts out all of the lactic acid and toxins and all that stuff? Correct. So, you know, if you look at high level track athletes, if you look at um, uh, football players, basketball players, et cetera, the end of their workout, they're usually walking back and forth, you know, Mm. trying that that's their cool down. That's their, there's, they don't just stop. What they do is they continue the blood flow in order to take these metabolic weights out of, once it's out of the working muscle, then it becomes dissipated throughout the entire body. And the body is recovered very uh, effectively. Uh, Same thing. Some, some athletes use cold water plunges, uh, some athletes use massage and our athletes use katsu. 
Will you explain the difference between the cold water plunge and katsu on the benefits? Because there's those are pretty popular right now. Yes. So cold water plunge, as you, you can imagine, and and I know this because of my the ice swimming experience that I had. I yeah. It is you 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 get in a, a cold body of water, very cold. And then what happens is the capillaries of your body uh shunt. They 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 don't close off, but they 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 come closer to the body and that's natural because when the body gets cold the body is very very good at protecting the vital organs in the body and so it because the body feels um the the sensors on the skin feel this very cold water the capillaries start receding back meaning they they actually get uh, narrow and narrow and that warm blood is reserved for your core and your brain. This is the body's natural human homo sapien response to cold water. So now they they uh, recede in the body, they get more narrow, and then you get out of the bot uh, out of the water, and now you're you're warm again, and they expand, just like katsu. As they expand, you get increased blood flow, and that's why a lot of people when you get in a cold plunge or a know, cold lake, wherever you are, and they get out, you see very rosy cheeks. You see mm -hmm. a rosiness to their skin because that's their capillaries expanding. And that red, that rosiness, that pinkness is actually <laughs> their red blood cells now very actively responding and enabling uh, uh, recovery. Well, as we're talking, I think this is a big mistake I've been making in my own workouts. Um, I'm kind of like the person you described a little bit. I'm a busy mom of two. We have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And I, I have a home gym in the basement. And so on a leg day, for example, I might do a ton of squats or bridges or split squats um, and then done. And then I'm like, okay, I got to go up the stairs. I got to get dinner ready. Yeah. And I'm not incorporating that cool down. And I have noticed as I've aged that my muscles become sore for longer periods of time. And one thing that I'm really trying to work on right now is not just being a healthy mom, but a fit mom. I want to get that, that fitness back that I had before I had kids to be able to run a half marathon or do whatever. And I'm really excited to use this technology because I think that this has been a really big missing piece to my recovery. I think I've had my di my nutrition dialed in for a long time, but I'm thinking through my programming on how can I speed it up? And I hate being cold. I hate being cold. And so this is exciting to me that I don't have to be cold and I can still speed up my recovery. So um, yeah. let's talk about just how someone like me who wants to improve their recovery so that they can train hard, harder the next day. How would you suggest I start using katsu if my goal, for example, would be to run a half marathon? And right now I'm at like three miles. Okay. So you could use it in multiple ways, but the most important way, the most effective way that I would recommend is when you go for a run or you do your morning workout and you're, you're doing your squats, your bridges, et cetera, throw the cots or use the cots bands on after you work out when you got it. You know, your your two year old, your five year old, they gotta they, they gotta eat, they gotta get ready for school. You're 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 I, I understand. We have four kids, so I understand yeah. completely. My my wife woke up and she was nonstop until the kids were in bed. I, yeah. it was it's crazy. <laughs> and in the, all that activity, your actually your brain is is thinking about multiple things at the same time. I gotta do this, this, and this at the same time. The, the kid is crying or the kid dropped a glass of milk, whatever it was, that's the perfect time to put the cots bands on. As you're actually moving, we call this concept is double stacking. You're preparing their lunch. You're preparing their meal. You're, 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 you're folding their clothes. You're washing their clothes. Um, you're, you're, you're blow drying your hair, you're brushing your teeth. These are all times to use the cut spans on your arms or your legs. What you're doing is you're engorging your limb and blood. That is increasing the elasticity of your vascular tissue, which is absolutely important for stamina and strength. You want the, that, that increased elasticity. So even though you're standing there in front of the mirror, brushing your teeth, 
and you have the bands on your arms, the actual elasticity of your vascular tissue is improving all over your body and mm. reverse. If you have it on your legs and you have the two-year-old in your arms, holding the two-year-old in your arms is a form of isometric exercise. You have the bands on your legs, they're inflating and deflating, but you're actually working on your upper body. And so when you're running, the muscle tone of your upper body is being improved, simply holding your two-year-old with the leg bands on. Now you can, if you wanna get very advanced, you can run with the bands on, the bands on the legs go high up on the groin. So there's no uh, impediment to running, but you don't have to. You know, if you're, if you'd like to uh, run and you, you have an athletic goal of a half marathon in the future, we always say, just enjoy running. Just you're out there, you're in solitude, you, you're thinking whatever thoughts you have, enjoy that. Use the katsu either before. So as you're getting your kids ready or you're, you're working, et cetera, et cetera, put the bands on your legs, stretch, take the bands off and then ready to go. And why? Now, it, imagine this, you've stretched, you've made your vascular tissue more elastic. You are now ready vascularly to run well. well if you it, don't, it's, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so it, it makes you actually prepared. It's a great warm up for your exit. If you only can do three miles, let's make sure those three miles are as efficient and effective as possible. So as a working mom with all kinds of duties, you can use the bands before workout to help the workout actually improve. You can use the bands after your workout to get rid of the metabolic response. And you can use the katsu throughout the day, whether you're holding a child or you know mixing oatmeal, whatever it is, uh, in order to um, improve the vascular elasticity of your body when you do train. One thing I was thinking of was... Um it seems like it takes me a while for my body to warm up when I'm starting to run. And you've probably had that experience as a swimmer. It's like, okay, the first mile is the hardest type of yeah, thing. And yeah. then you kind of get over that hump. So does the katsu kind of help you get over that hump faster? Yeah. So it does it in two ways. One, um, we always recommend if, whether it's a Olympic track athlete or a working mom, uh, you know, beginning a running program, put the bands on about 15 minutes before you're going to go out for your run. And it could be during those 15 minutes, you are stretching, but more likely if you're a working person, you, you've got, you're doing other things. You're, 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 you're just busy. And then finally, when you're ready to run, you put on your shoes and, and, and head out the door. Now in those 15 minutes, you can be doing other things, but you have the bands on. When you take the bands off, put your shoes on and now you're ready to go run a vascularly because of the increased vascular tissue, your working muscles are more prepared to work out. So that, that first mile it took you to warm up to that level, you're already there. The first step secondly, mm -hmm. and very importantly, this is a, a big revelation we had with the cardiologist. We found that after you take off the bands, there's this magic window of about 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, where this metabolic response takes some time to actually be optimized. So in other words, at about the 12 minute mark, your human growth hormone, your adrenaline starts to kick in at a maximal level. So now you started that, you've taken off the bands, vascularly you're prepared and about 12 minutes later hormonally you are maximized and that part of that is beta endorphin the runner's high and now you're feeling really good so our professional athletes and our olympians our soldiers special forces army rangers uh uh green berets uh navy seals they're using this before they have to do something because they know vascularly and metabolically, they will be optimized. I think that's awesome. You, you obviously you do a great job explaining this. You were there for 13 years before yeah. you said that you're ready. I have um one of my questions was actually about the lymphatic system and who this may not be appropriate for. So um 
at the time of this recording, we just released a really great episode with an occupational therapist who talked about um, lymphedema and how the vascular system, or excuse me, the lymphatic system is just right under the skin and just the most gentle amount of pressure can impede that. Have you seen anything where this may not be appropriate from a lymphatic system, or have you seen that it helps people with lymphatic conditions? Uh, so everybody, almost everybody that comes to us over a certain age has some issue, some issue. The people that we say first speak to your physician about this are people with cardiac issues. Um, and it isn't necessarily the fact that they will have a heart attack. In fact, it's proven they won't have a heart attack. But the fact that if they use the katsu and because it's gentle, because it's gentle, they tend to push themselves more than their cardiac, than their cardiac, uh, cardiac uh, cardiologist recommends. And so even though it feels gentle, and that's often the response we have, he says, well, this doesn't feel so bad. Because in their mind, remember, they're thinking this, yeah. not yeah. this. And so when they don't feel this, and they feel this gentle um, uh, uh, phenomenon, they tend to push themselves more. And if you're a person um, older, taking blood thinners, and your cardiologist says, you know, it's probably not good that your heart rate is above 120 or 140, whatever it is but they feel the gentleness of this, <laughs> they tend to push themselves more than their cardiologist. So we always like to, to recommend for people with cardiac issues, we provide uh, them and their cardiologists with all the information that we have from our cardiologist team that produce a variety of papers on this so they can study and understand katsu. So people with lymphatic issues, uh, they usually have other other related issues. For them, we put on katsu very, very gently, even more lightly with less pressure than everybody else. And, mm -hmm. and that includes people with Raynaud's disease. It includes people with, for, with multiple sclerosis. There, there are certain conditions in, or certain situations in the human body where the normal katsu um, pressure is a little too much. What it, what it actually makes them feel, this, uh, they, they do katsu normally. When they take the bands off, that's when they start to feel discomfort. So for those people, we, we recommend they put on the katsu bands, uh, I'll show you here, uh, less tightly. So on the unit here, when we turn it on, I'm gonna turn it on right here. And you can see very uh, quickly there, there's a, I'm gonna go to the uh, cycle mode that is pressure on pressure off. I'm gonna say on the arms. Then there are four different types of pressure, low pressure, medium pressure, high pressure, and custom pressure. Custom pressure means I can set this to be lower than low, or if I'm an Olympic athlete or Navy SEAL, I could put it higher than high. And so we have this um, custom mode where you can actually put it very, very gently. And we generally do this for someone who is, um, let's say you're morbidly obese, you have lymphatic issues, and you've got a history of cardiac issues. That would be someone who would use a lower than low pressure. But it, it's, it's helpful. It, it doesn't harm anything because the compression is very mild. And intermittent. And so, intermittent for 30 seconds yeah. max. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would you suggest I start on maybe medium or high or like how does someone gauge where they should start? Everybody starts at low. 100%. Okay. Olympic medalists, Navy SEALs started, start at low. Now, because you're younger, certainly younger than me, and you, you're very fit, you can do one set of low and then go to medium and perhaps even high. So even when we have bedridden patients who have cardiac issues, et cetera, after three, four, five, six months, they start at low and they gradually, very gradually increase to high. What we see is when they, I took the bands off. So now my hands are both the same color, but 
as we see, and it's especially helpful for people with uh, uh, neuropathic pain or, or bad circulation in their hands and feet, you start to see their hands get rosy and pink and, and really, um, you know, when, when you have good circulation in your hands, then, you know, you can open a jar of, of uh, uh, jam more easily. You can comb your hair more easily. A lot of people have, you know, pain, especially older, just to comb their hair or blow dry their hair, um, put um, uh, cups and dishes up on their cupboard. So with that increase of circulation, you can do many things, but we always have to remember it. And this is why everybody starts at the low pressure is that our vascular system has taken years and decades to be the, in the conditions that they currently are. And therefore, it doesn't take one hour or one day to get them nice and elastic like we were when we were a teenager. It takes time, uh, weeks and months to get back to an optimal uh, 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 elasticity. Do people overdo it? So I'm thinking <laughs> I'm, you know, we, we have so many people with that all or nothing mindset and the go-getters who listen to this and I'm going to get this and I'm going to wear it for 10 hours a day. You know, is there a way to overdo this? And how do you know if you're doing that? Uh, yes. I mean, like I said, we work with professional athletes. We work with, uh, we have billionaires, we have uh, uh, celebrities, we have uh, uh, Navy SEALs. We, these people are type A personalities. They, they absolutely need to be number one. Um, and that's what makes them so great. And generally people who need to be number one or need to be the best or not even comparison to anybody else, just themselves, they're driven people, type A personalities. Yes, they can do this too much. Now it won't hurt you. It's just that, you know, if you do it two or three hours a day, the incremental benefit to you, are it just becomes lesser and lesser. And what we would prefer is they, you do it, you know, up to an hour a day and really incorporate it into your lifestyle. If, yeah. for example, you, you know, you're, you're waking up before your kids, hopefully, may, hopefully they're not waking you I up. Do. But... Now, now they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wasn't like that for a long time, but it yeah. is now. Yeah. So, you know, your sleep is interrupted. So because your sleep is interrupted, you know, you're getting less quality sleep. So what can you do? They're probably going to bed before you. Mm -hmm. So once you put them down and, and you're doing everything else uh, that you have to do in your life to prepare for the next day or to finish what you did for this day, you can put the bands on in the evening, put them on your arms, use only low pressure. And this actually activates a parasympathetic nervous system. It relaxes you mm -hmm. from your shoulders on up. So when you hit your bed, and we have this all documented, when you hit your uh, hit the bed, you can fall into a deeper sleep more quickly. And we learned this at the service academies where the the Air Force Academy cadets, they don't, they have very little time to sleep. So the time they have to sleep needs to be quality sleep. And they had a whoop device and katsu, and they were able, to, we saw they, they can't have more time in the day to sleep, but the time that they're in bed, we want them to sleep well. So that probably somewhat mirrors the responsibilities that lie on your shoulders where, you know, you don't have that much sleep, but the sleep you get, we want to optimize. That's huge. I mean, we probably should have started with that benefit and that would have really perked people up because yeah. um, a lot of our audience does st struggle with sleep and they're kind of grasping at straws sometimes and they don't want to do all the supplements. And I always love finding natural solutions that don't have any side effects. So what a yeah. great idea. Um, yes. And I think it's important to talk about incorporating anything new, any new modality into your lifestyle. So I love that. So kind of in the evening for maybe 30 minutes, before I go to sleep with my blue light blockers and yes. then before and after my workout for a short amount of time to kind of prime my body and then help my body recover after. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you in Dr. Peter Atia's book, he mentioned, I can't remember the specifics, but I know that he uses katsu and I know that he, I thought did like 30 repetitions of certain exercises with it on. So he was actually doing exercises 
with kotsu. So up until this point, we've really been talking about using it as a primer and a recovery aid, but how can you use it during exercise? Yeah, we the one of the benefits of having these, these narrow bands as opposed to a, a blood pressure cuff is it allows complete range of motion, both upper body and lower body. And so people like uh, Dr. Atia, but also professional baseball players that are in the playoffs right now, uh, NBA players who, you know, we, we know whether they're shooting a three point shot, practicing their pitches or working on their 40 yard dash. If they're a football player, you can actually use these bands in performance, in training. And that could mean just simply lifting weights. It could be a uh, jumping rope. Uh, we have professional tennis players who they're out on the court with the bands on, serving, uh, volleying, backhand, you name it. So uh, we have pianists. We have uh, people who play uh, the bass, the guitar, the drums, et cetera, who use the bands as they're doing their uh, uh, chosen profession or activity. And that is a great, great use. So let, let's just take a, um, uh, a shot putter for example. So a shot putter typically is in the weight room, you know, lifting weights with a, a, a chest press, a shoulder press, bicep curls, et cetera. And then they go out on the track and they practice their, their technique to shot put a 16 pound, you know, steel metal ball. Now, when you have the cuts bands on and you're practicing your actual shot put, or your baseball throw, or your golf swing, you're actually strengthening the muscle in the exact motion that you want to be strengthened. Now, of course, a bench press or shoulder press makes you stronger, but it makes you stronger for a bench press or a shoulder press. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily make you stronger for all the very specific athletic movements, a shot put, a baseball throw, a golf swing, and when we put on the bands, as we do our athletic uh, activity, whatever that is, that strengthens the muscle in the exact motion that you want in order to be the best that you can be. Yep. That task specific training there. is really important. So from a weightlifting standpoint, it sounded like Dr. Tia used it definitely towards the end of a workout but he didn't use it with heavy weights. And is that kind of what you recommend is a lighter weight, higher much, repetition? Much, much lighter weight. And in fact, if we were just talking about the bench press, right? we would recommend, you know, bench press is a bar and then there's heavy plates on either side. We recommend just using the bar, just the bar, no weights at the end. With the bands on, we recommend that you use a high, if, if you want to get stronger, simply use a higher pressure, not a higher weight. Gotcha. So you're, you're using, you're, what you're doing is you're engorging the, the working muscles more as you go through the motion. The body and the brain doesn't, it doesn't matter what the weight is. It really matters what is the effect on the working muscles. And because we have this engorgement, because we have this metabolic response, we are achieving what we want to do. What is very interesting is a lot of women through our observations and data understand that very well. Men, especially uh, uh, young fit men, they just like the <laughs> psychological rush of a big heavy weight and uh -huh. dropping it and go, whoa, I just did it. Women yeah. understand, well, wait a second. It doesn't really matter if it's a hundred pounds or 10 pounds or one pound. If the effects are exactly what I want and I can use a lighter weight, therefore you're not stressing the ligaments and tendons and muscles to actually lift that heavy, heavy weight and possibly injure yourself and obviously get that soreness that comes with lifting heavy weights. And I think Dr. Atia understood that through trial and error. And now, you know, he does his preferred exercises with the bands on with a uh, lighter weight than he uh, normally would have used before. 
Right. And I think it might be helpful here if you have an answer for this. Whenever we're dosing people for strength training, what we typically recommend are working up to like 10 to 12 repetitions to fatigue. And so we have that end point of fatigue as the end goal to indicate that you're really challenging your muscles hard enough. Um, and so we don't want people to be able to do, you know, 20 overhead shoulder presses, and then they can keep going, but they stop because they're bored and they're tired of counting. We want them to reach that fatigue. Now, do you have any similar recommendations from a blood flow, um, restriction exercise protocol standpoint on this is about how it should feel when you get done with your repetitions with the blood flow or with the COTS device on? Yeah. If. Uh, yes, we do. So if we are looking at um, increasing the muscle size or strength, which is not always the case for all athletes, mm -hmm. there are some gymnasts and swimmers, uh, boxers, uh, there are many sports where weight is a limiting factor. So you, you can't be a small guy like me and want to fight heavyweight and a heavyweight needs to drop weight in order to fight middleweight. So there's a lot of sports where we have to maintain our weight. Now, what we do and what we recommend is generally, if you're looking at muscle strength or muscle size gains, you would do four sets. The first set, you would go to fatigue, whatever number that is, it could be 12, it could be 24, it could be 36, whatever it is, just go to fatigue. And that is the signal to the brain that the lactate has built up to an uncomfortable level. The key now is for the second, third, and fourth set is you only rest 20 seconds. So even though the band mm -hmm. is inflating and deflating, inflating and deflating, those five seconds does not allow all of the lactate to be whooshed out of the working muscle. Some of it, but not all of it. In 20 seconds, then you do your second set. Now you go to fatigue again. Inevitably, instead of doing 24, you're only at, let's say 10. Mm -hmm. The third set, you maximum of a 20 seconds rest. This third set, you're doing as, as much as you can do. You go to maximum, or you go to fatigue, and that may be six. And then 20 seconds rest, this last one might be one or two. Then you go on to your next exercise. Again, only 20 seconds rest, and you do the same process. You go from more um, repetitions to fewer repetitions, only 20 seconds rest. And at the end, what you do, especially if you're using light weights, is with the light weights, you're not tearing the muscle fiber. There's no micro uh, trauma in the uh, muscle fibers. And therefore, you take the bands off, you get this uh, human growth hormone release, but you don't have the uh, micro trauma that causes that uh, delayed muscle uh, uh, soreness. And so you finish your workout, you're fatigued, but you're not sore. Interesting. So that's kind of the opposite of what you would traditionally do. And at least from what I've talked yes. to people is you want to allow adequate rest periods between your sets to rebuild your creatine. If, if you're doing, let's say like some squats or some lunges, um, to rebuild the, you know, the ATP and all that stuff so that you can bring as much force and power into the next set as possible. So that's a really good distinction. If we're using the COTS devices, you suggest that training protocol to build strength and muscle mass. Is that what you yes, said too? Yes. Yes. Great to know. I'm going to experiment with that. Okay. What about muscular endurance? Is that kind of, uh, so muscular different. endurance, yes, it will be different. Okay. So um, we have strength and size, you have uh, muscle stamina, and then you have muscle speed. So mm -hmm. more if you're, you're if you're someone focused on a fast twitch muscle, let's say a baseball player, let's say a golfer, let's say a boxer, let's say um, a track athlete who wants to explode off of the blocks. All of these require you to use the cut spans on going the speed that you want to go in your event. So if you, you want to get out off the blocks as quickly as possible, you're using the cots bands and just exploding off the blocks. You do it once, you do it twice, you do it three times. 
Then you take the bands off and then you do it without the bands on. Our track athletes, our swimmers, our, our combative sports athletes tell us, they go, I, how does it feel? They go, I feel light. Mm -hmm. I feel so much lighter. And then they continue their workout without the bands on. And in muscle stamina, it's this, it's very similar. Muscle stamina, let's say we when we work with uh, marathon runners, uh, triathletes, uh, English channel swimmers, um, English uh, Mount Everest mountaineers, all of those people are, are you know, it, it sustained effort over time. So we asked the person, what is the pace that you would like to run at, swim at or row at, whatever the case is. And so they tell us, and I'll just use a, a rough figure. They say, I want to be able to run um, 400 meters every one minute. Let's say that's their, their goal. We say, okay, so let's put the bands on very, very light, very light. Now run the 400 meters in one minute, no faster, no slower. They do that during their workout. The next day, we put the, because the, uh, the unit itself, we can actually uh, change this pressure very, very incrementally. So the next day or the next week, we put up this pressure slightly more, run no faster, run no slower than that one minute for, for 400 meter pace. And we continue that throughout the season. What we are effectively doing is we're asking the athlete to continue to run at the same pace. But if we can use an analogy, we're doing it at higher and higher altitudes. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're training at you're running one, uh, 400 meters at one a minute pace at sea level. By the second month, you're effectively doing that same pace at a thousand feet at altitude then 2000 feet at altitude 3000 feet in altitude and the uh, the muscular uh, uh, stamina will increase because you have this increased ability not only to put muscle uh, blood into the muscle but actually to allow it to be removed more effectively as you're exercising so we have different protocols depending on what you want to achieve with katsu and that blood removal is important. So it goes back to the lungs to get yes. more oxygen, to go yes. back out to the muscles, to be, to, to continue to work. So do you find that it keeps, for example, swimmers or marathon runners, um, oh, does it increase their lactic acid threshold where like they can sustain aerobic activity for a longer amount of time? You know, yeah, does so that make sense? Okay. Yeah, so that's exactly why we developed the, and actually it was the Japanese marathon runners in the 1990s who developed this protocol. And when we started to introduce it to the swimming, rowing, um, a cross country skiing world, the Tour de France cyclists, they instinctively understood that process. And they've all been doing this interval training at higher and higher pressures, but only incrementally. You can't go from, a low pressure to high pressure right away. The body doesn't respond that way, mm -hmm. but because these athletes are, are doing things that uh, it, it, in terms of several minutes or hours at a time, the body is a, you know, it's body is a miracle, but it does take time to adapt to certain mechanical stress. And Katsu is a, is a huge mechanical stress. So we do it very, very incrementally. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I think I've answered all the questions that I had, or you've answered all the questions that I've had today. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about Katsu or its benefits or its uses with people? I mean, our oldest user is 104 years old. Yeah. We proved um, to increase the muscle mass of her legs 22%. That's all documented. Wow. That's amazing. It is made. And what does that allow her to? It allows her to go to the supermarket and carry her own bags of groceries. It allows her to get up and down the stairs with, actually, she, went, she wasn't able to do that before. Yeah. And so, you know, we have a lot of users in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and above 100. Uh, most of our users, I would 70% of our users are women between the ages 50 and 75. We do have a lot of lead athletes. Um, uh, we have a lot of soldiers uh, in the U.S. military. Um, and so 
you know, we, we have ice skaters, we have, uh, 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 arm wrestlers, uh, and we have, but most of the people are just working people who have a work, uh, have a job, have kids. Uh, their day is just filled with responsibilities and cuts can fit in that day very effectively and very efficiently. And so your own day is not impacted. It is enhanced. And that's what I'd like to share and relate to everybody. I have, I thought of one more question as you were speaking uh -huh. with um, the aging population. How about youth? I mean, my son is five. He's super athletic. Um, I feel like he's going to be a, a sports guy. And um, what's the youngest population that you've used Katsu on? Well, it's interesting. So, it on, yeah. So uh, in, in Asia, again, a population that that has traditionally thought of their own population as smaller and less physically gifted than the Western populations, they're using katsu very, very early. Here in the United States and in Western Europe, we generally say when your child is in high school, um, that's a good time to do it. You know, between the ages of birth to 12, 13, 14, their little bodies are developing so quickly. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you've probably... How many pairs of pants has your five-year-old gone through, you know, from zero to now? And he he or she will continue to grow. And that is there, there is there, the little perfect little human bodies are put are pushing out so many hormones. Mm -hmm. They're they're just growing so much. So Dr. Sato my and myself, we prefer that their little bodies continue to grow. Now, when they get into high school and they're interested in sports or music or dance, cuts can enhance their performance without a doubt. Um, and so generally we say around 14 years old or a freshman in high school is a really good time. And I, I have four kids. They all went through this process. We all waited till they were in high school. And to this day, they're now in their 20s and they've all been using katsu. So, you know, High school is a good time to start, especially if their coach, whoever their coach is mm -hmm. in high school or club, if their coach understands the use of katsu, what is really important with, and, and we've seen this from California to Virginia, from Massachusetts to uh, Seattle. I mean, the coaches, sometimes they can be overzealous and kids have overuse injuries because the coach is just pushing them too much. Mm -hmm. With Katsu, the coaches have suddenly realized, wait a second, I can train for muscular strength, muscular stamina, and muscular speed very efficiently. So they have completely eliminated this, these overuse, the, the probability of overuse injuries. Instead mm -hmm. of running that kid or making that kid lift a lot of weights or whatever, the kid can still get stronger, faster, run further, jump higher, but without the overuse injuries. And I think that is the biggest benefit that we've seen for teenagers or uh, college uh, student athletes uh, with Katsu. I wonder if it's even just going to be kind of standard of practice um, pretty soon. I think in geriatric physical therapy, one of my classmates, I know, I don't know if he is, a, you know, affiliated with Katsu or not, but he does a lot of continuing education on this type of thing for uh, geriatric rehab. But my guess is by the time my son gets into high school, this is going to be a lot more mainstream, don't you think? Don't so you hope, have, I bet? <laughs> yeah, we have about 80 universities um, that are using Katsu now for their student athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and I look across the board and these are the the top level uh, you know, these are the colleges you read about in the newspaper or you see on ESPN there. Uh, when I go into a college university setting, uh, the coaches and the trainers have a huge responsibility. They're they're treating young adults. Yes. But these young adults are still students. They're not professional yeah. athletes. And so there's a lot of responsibility on these athletes. And there's certainly nowadays there's a lot of care that they're not pushing the kids too much, too hard, too harshly. And Katsu exactly fits that model. And so, you know, I think, I, I don't know if it's going to be at every university, at every school, but certainly it's going to be at the top level uh, universities, at the top level 
uh, sports organizations. And that's why if you look back at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, we had so many medalists in so many different sports. Yeah, well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure my audience has learned a lot. Can you let us know where we can go buy some COTS bands and start <laughs> using them ourselves? Yes, you can go to uh, uh, www.katsu, K-A-A-T-S-U. It means additional pressure in English. Um, and if you have any questions, you can email me at info, I-N-F-O, at katsu.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you. I know that you've just had a really cool life story. You know, you're a father of four, um, your husband, you have um, such a, a cool career, both um, with your athletic background and your business background. And I think what you're doing is just a really cool thing because it's it's such, there's so many widespread benefits, you know, from the youth to the aging a lot of different applications for this. And I, I just wish you the very best with this, um, with spreading the Katsu me message. Thank you. I, I do want to say, you know, our goal at Katsu is when anybody does Katsu, they finish what, what we call the Katsu smile. When a person can finish Katsu and smile, we know that our job is done. And that's our mission to bring the Katsu smile to as many people as possible. Awesome. Well, I am excited. I'm going to go okay. order some and try them out. And I, I know that they're, they're going to help me. I'm going to feel a lot better. I'm going to feel less sore and um, do a better job with my warm up and cool down. I think that's yeah. what it's going to help me the most with. So thank you. Right. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye.